Paul Marion, President of Tiffany University. Welcome to this morning's Good Morning World. This is a community service that Tiffany University has provided for many years and has brought a number of very interesting speakers to our community, uh, which uh, brings in not only community leaders and uh, adults in the community, but some of our students as well. And uh, thinking about the topic for today, we wanted to make sure we had a good crowd, so I asked Ron Schumacher a couple of months ago to make sure that the weather in January and February was <laughs> unique well uh, to generate some interest in this topic, and I, I'm impressed with uh, Ron's ability to do that. <laughs> but I do think, given the, uh, the weather that we've had and, and uh, what's been going on here, that this topic is on everybody's mind, and we're very pleased to have an outstanding speaker and at this time, I'd like to ask Ron Schumacher, our Vice President for Development and Public Affairs, to introduce the speaker. Thanks, Dr. Marion. I will only take credit for the weather over the next hour and a half. I think it's the rest of the day, because I know what's coming. Jay Birchback. You can watch Jay on 13 ABC Action News at 5 p.m., 5.30, 6, and 11 p.m. Jay has earned his television seal of approval from both the American Meteorological Society and the National Weather Association. He is also an active member in both organizations. Jay, earned a graduate, uh, Jay is a graduate of the University of Michigan's College of Engineering. Jay received a bachelor's degree in atmospheric, oceanic, and space sciences all meteor, meteorology degrees. While attending college, he was the fill-in weather anchor at WLNS in Lansing, Michigan, and he worked at a private weather forecasting company called Commercial Weather Services, Inc. Jay says 13 Action News Live Doppler 13,000 and Viper are the most outstanding <coughs> weather equipment he has worked with to date. Jay also loves visiting area schools to talk with children of all ages about the weather live Doppler, and the television business in general. Jay's most memorable moment as a newscaster was his participation in coverage commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Toledo Zoo in June 2000. While covering his story, Jay made, national television, made his national television debut when he appeared on Good Morning America alongside Tony Perkins and got the chance to meet and interview Jack Hanna. Jay's interest includes sporting events as a fan and a participant, traveling and naturally the weather. In October 98, he married his high school sweetheart, Jenny. They have two sons, Ben and Will. Please welcome today our speaker, Jay Burschbeck, and follow your dreams. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. You guys all make it here despite the uh, slippery conditions. And as you can see on the radar, a quick weather cast here. That is a live radar you see in the upper left corner. So uh, might get a little slick. Thank you, Jason, for circling that. But uh, probably by the end of my speech, uh, we'll start seeing some raindrops outside. And it could begin as freezing rain today. So we'll have to be careful walking back to your cars, if I forget to say that. Uh, as I say with people, walk like a penguin, right? Little baby steps so we don't slip and fall, uh, but eventually it does change back to rain. So it's coming, it should change to rain and get windy tonight and then get colder for tomorrow. Uh, about me again, uh, Ron mentioned I married my high school sweetheart, Jenny. Uh, I grew up near Detroit, went to the University of Michigan, uh, I was actually kindergarten sweethearts with my now wife. Uh, our, our sisters were really good friends through high school and college. So I've been with her family and going on vacations with them since I was in kindergarten. So think about that. Now she has red hair, so that was really a bad thing for her in fourth grade because I used to tease her at school and apparently I brought her to tears a few times, you know, with with name calling. Now, not, not a pe mean person, okay, I'm not mean, <laughs> but just typical fourth grade teasing, which was really flirting. And eventually, uh, we started dating. It was homecoming, freshman year in high school. So we had been really good friends for so long, had to pick a date. I said, oh, you wanna go to the dance with me, you know? Okay, so we went, and then the next day, I called her and had the big question for her. 
hey, do you want to be boyfriend, girlfriend? <laughs> and then, of course, was after about four or five hang-ups. You know, you, you dial the number and you're so nervous you hang up, and then you dial the number and you're so nervous and you hang up, and then you dial the number, you're so nervous and you hang up. Well, eventually I had the courage and I got to the message and popped the question, not the question, but a question, and we've been dating ever since. So we were 14 years old at that point, got married on our 10-year, one-day dating anniversary. So we dated for almost 10 years exactly, and uh, now we have two sons. You saw them in that commercial there. Uh, the boy raising his hand saying, we'll have fog in the morning, thick fog. That's my oldest son, his name's Ben. And the little boy next to him, the redhead, is my other son, his name's Will. And they're 10 and 12, so. Besides the weather business, they, uh, they keep us quite busy. Uh, growing up, famous story for me, people ask all the time, how did you get involved in weather? What, what made you want to become a meteorologist? Well, visualize me as a fourth grader. So we were all in fourth grade at some point. Uh, was at home one day for lunch, because I lived close to the school. Happened to be a big thunderstorm, and back then there was no cable TV. There was no satellite TV, there was no internet. We all had this huge antenna on top of the house to receive TV signals. So imagine the TV is by the steps over here, and I'm kind of just watching the television, eating a grilled cheese sandwich, tomato soup, and then I had a Klondike bar for dessert. So I was at the Klondike bar part of this. So I was eating dessert, having a great time. A lightning bolt zapped the antenna. The electricity went down the wires into the TV set, and it blew up right in front of me. So fourth grader, TV blowing up, not a happy camper. Uh, a few more tears possibly at that point. But thereafter, uh, my mom took me to the library. No such thing as Googling it, right, back then. And uh, basically got books on weather. Lightning, thunder, hail, tornadoes, hurricanes, things like that. And I began to study the weather to get over my fear of thunderstorms and why it blew up my TV. So pretty amazing story. I was OK. All the glass and stuff that shattered fell in front of me, and we got a brand new TV set too, so <laughs> thank you insurance. Um, I used to want to be a pilot as well as a child, so weather and, and flying, of course, go hand in hand. Would still love someday to get my private pilot's license, but at this point, don't have the time or the money. So at some point, maybe once the kids are in college or beyond, and and I win the lottery, which I didn't do last night, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, that's definitely an idea to, to hopefully fly at some point. As far as my college path, went to the University of Michigan. Uh, the degree, in case you missed it, is a long, fancy-sounding degree. It's Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Space Sciences. At Michigan, rather than just give out a meteorology degree, they teach us the interaction with the oceans, the air, and space. They're all connected. So rather than just learn the middle part of the atmosphere, if you think of it as a cake, they taught us the below layer and the, and the upper layer and the way it makes the weather happen with weather patterns globally and how it affects our day-to-day -day weather. First two years in college, uh, for you younger folks out there, uh, I was undecided. A lot of kids go into college thinking, I just don't know what I want to do yet with my life. So I took basic classes like math and history and I think even a term of French. Took a few uh, liter um, what do you call them? Literary classes? You know, about, uh, about uh, the, not just history, but about books. And, and, uh, and finally, after two years, so two years at U of M, after taking general classes on my way to some kind of uh, literature, science, and arts degree, I thought, you know what? I really like the weather. So I took a weather class and loved it. Got an A. OK, so I'm like, OK. I liked it. I have always liked weather since I began studying this thing back in fourth grade. Got an A in the class. I think I might want to study weather and meteorology. So found out after some research, I'd have to transfer from the College of Ellison A, which is the overall general U of M student population, to the College of Engineering. And it was a pretty in-depth step. Thankfully, I did well in, in school when I was in high school, so I had some of the AP classes uh, with calculus and things like that, uh, but successfully transferred into the engineering school. Now, it was hard uh, because the last two years at U of M, while everybody else was kind of on pace for a four-year plan, I had to squeeze four years of engineering into two years of school. And it was 
not fun, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, and calculus, physics, fluids, stats, thermo, um, just classes that I don't really use anymore as far as the education, but the logic that it taught me, I use every day. And in theory, what we see on TV every day with the Dopplers and the predictors and the computer models and everything like that, uh, the, the classes that deal with statistics and calculus, those come into play with the equations that you never see. When we show a predictor on TV and say, okay, the rain will be here at 7 a.m. and it'll be here at 9 a.m. and it'll be snow at 12 p.m., that's all done using science and mathematics and trillions of equations done by these supercomputers that help us make a forecast. So even though I don't use exactly what I learned at the College of Engineering at U of M, um, the logic it taught me and the premise helps me every day at work. And I can hopefully determine, we have about 20 to 30 computer models we can look at. I can determine which one is on track and which ones are off track. That's really why I have a job right now. Okay? We all have, well, we don't all have, but most people have cell phones nowadays or access to the internet. You have radio weather, you have uh, newspaper weather, you have weather you hear from friends and family, right? Hey, there's a big storm coming. Uh, but when I go on TV, I'm analyzing the data that's available, and from that, using my education, instinct, <clears throat> gut feelings, you name it, to go on TV and pick that one solution from all of those choices. Whether it be a past storm that we see that was coming and taking the same track and curved to the right at the last second, I can predict, okay, well that last time we saw a storm take this track, it curved. So keep that in mind when you see this information on this next storm. The last time we saw this, it curved, so maybe this one will curve as well. So there's a lot of preparation going into the uh, the day-to-day -day forecasting, and that's kind of where U of M came in. Um, to my career, I did go to U of M, and if you were a keen listener, uh, the first station I worked at was in Lansing, Michigan. U of M is in Ann Arbor, Michigan State is in East Lansing. And that goes back to my wife. Uh, she went to Michigan State, and I went to Michigan. The schools are about an hour apart as the crow flies. So I would make many, many trips up to East Lansing and visit her at MSU. So in that time, I had a couple of colleagues ahead of me, a few years ahead of me, that did internships at the TV station in East Lansing, uh, the CBS station, WLNS. So I had an internship at that station uh, for a whole summer, got to make the maps that, the, that you saw on TV with the chief meteorologist, got some time in front of that key wall. Have you all seen a green or a blue wall that we stand in front of and there's nothing behind us? But magically on TV, it looks like there's something behind us. Uh, that takes some practice. Everything's backwards. How is it backwards? Well, think about it this way. When you look in the mirror and you stick out your left hand, it appears like you're looking back at yourself with your right hand, okay? Kind of like, like that? When I'm on TV sticking my left hand out, I'm looking back with my left hand, which appears to be over here, so I'm kind of going like this. Uh, to put it in your perspective, uh, if you've seen pictures of yourself, and it, I, I guess a question for you, if you've seen pictures of yourself, has it looked different than your mirror image that you look at every day? I think so. Like my part over here in a mirror is, looks like it's on my right side because you're looking back at yourself with your right hand. So anyway, maybe after the talk, everyone go to the mirror over there. <laughs> take a look at yourself, stick your hand out, take a picture of yourself, stick your hand out, and see what happens. But uh, there is some practice to that. So uh, that was something that takes time as you just do your internship. They'd all go to dinner. I'd stay in the studio for hours and hours and just go through weather casts and pretend like the TV was on and the cameras were on and, and we were good to go. Like anything else in life, it usually gets easier and easier the more you do it. And thankfully that was the case. Uh, first time on TV was in Lansing. Uh, it's one of those stories you hear from, I don't know, many careers that uh, the guy that was supposed to be on TV or the guy that was supposed to do the work got sick. Last second, couldn't make it to work. There I am making maps and getting things together with my internship and there's nobody else there to do it. So they literally said, you know, kid, this is your shot. <laughs> and they shoved me on TV and said, you're on, kid. And uh, 
It wasn't pretty, let's just put it that way. Uh, if you can imagine a robot doing the weather, that's basically how it looked like. It was very much like this. Yeah. So, I'll do it over here too, but like, you know. <laughs> Kinda, you know, very, very tight, very nervous, very, oh, get this over, oh my goodness. So it, it wasn't great. But I got through it, got the information out, talked with the news anchors and smiled and, and did an okay. So thereafter, they had a lot of vacation time coming up. They didn't have a fourth meteorologist. They said, hey, do you want to do some fill-in work for us and, and help out while these guys are on vacation? Okay. So I got my second chance to be on TV and my third chance and my fourth chance and my fifth chance. And from there, it got more and more comfortable. Well, still wasn't great, but it got better and better. And what's even more nerve-wracking is my future wife and her sorority sisters would watch me. I'd see her after the show, and they'd all razz me about my performance. So, so back then, so young. Uh, it, it is an enjoyable job. It's a fun job. Um, before I get to that, though, I want to talk about my career path, because it was fun, too. Uh, after Lansing, I don't want to go get ahead of myself. After Lansing and graduating from U of M, I got my first full-time job in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is just west of Indy, uh, at the NBC station. Did the mornings for two years. Uh, funny story with my contract, I almost moved up to Traverse City, Michigan, after Terre Haute. But in the TV business, we deal with contracts, like baseball players, football players, and you, you deal money and deal time. So during my negotiations with Traverse City, um, there was a fax that was intercepted by my general manager in Terre Haute. Basically, he knew I was going to leave and go to Traverse City, so he threatened to, one, fire me, and two, to sue me if I took the job in Traverse City, because I was still under contract for about two to three weeks. And in the business, normally, there's a kind of a gray period at the end of your contract where you can, you can start looking for another job if you want. We're not going to prosecute you for breaking or breaching the contract. But he wasn't happy that I was trying to sneak it in, dumb me, you know, the station fax machine, because I didn't have one in my apartment. So <laughs> it was like 6 in the morning. I thought, he won't be here for a few more hours. Well, he was there. And he grabbed the fax right away and wasn't a good situation. So down in the dumps, I thought, oh my goodness, my career is over. He's going to fire me. I'm not going to have a job. This is going to get out. And no one's going to hire me in the future, because this is the one that leaves early and goes and finds new jobs. Uh, but then got a call from Toledo, from the news director at Channel 13, and uh, had an interview the next week, got the job, and here we are today, 15 years later. It's been a while. Started off as weekends. The morning person left, went to Raleigh-Durham, got the morning job for 13 years. I woke up at 2 in the morning for 13 years. Whew. That's why this morning's wake-up call <laughs> was such a shock. Uh, now I go to work at about 2 or 3 p.m., so it's, it's a complete flip-flop. But I've uh, been chief now for almost two years. Stan Stachek retired, and uh, after a brief search and consideration, they gave me the chief job and loving it. Love working with Diane and Lee in the evening, and uh, it's a good life. So it's a great career. It is fun. I think sometimes that you know, you got to visualize the camera as a person, personify that camera. So if I was talking to this sign, for instance, you have to imagine that sign as grandma, or mom, or dad, or your cousin, or your friend, or your, your son, or your nephew, and speak to that thing as a person. Because I'm talking to you right now. I can see you looking back at me and smiling and nodding and shaking your head and doing things. I can't see that, obviously, when I'm talking to a camera and broadcasting to thousands of people at once. So you have to put in your mind, I'm not speaking to a camera, I'm speaking to you and you and you and you and you and you, you. So that's something that comes with the job as well, is that it's people. We give the weather forecast, yeah, okay, it's gonna snow, it's gonna rain, but how does that impact you? Like the ice today, I was worried all week. I'm like, oh, if that ice comes in at six in the morning, I have to drive down to Tiffin and freezing rain, uh, many of you probably wouldn't have ventured out if there was freezing rain falling right now, but thankfully it worked out. Uh, big snowstorms, of course, affect schools, businesses, commerce, travel, you name it. So just there's so much impacted directly by the weather that it's more than just talking about the weather. It's trying to help the public, keep people safe. 
Uh, if you have a doctor's appointment at two o'clock today, should you cancel it, should you go? So that's one benefit or one big plus in my job is I think I am doing good. I realize we're not right every day, right? Who thinks the weather people are right every day? Raise your hand. <laughs> Got 20 bucks in it for you, okay. <laughs> we're not. The weather is not unpredictable, but it's very difficult to predict. We're predicting the future every day. Think if a stockbroker predicted the future every day perfectly. Think of a sports bookie, right? I don't condone betting, but if you knew exactly who was gonna win that game tonight by exactly how much, and you put some money on that, you'd be a rich person. <laughs> so anything in the future, down the road, we're predicting what's going to happen, and there are trillions of variables that go into our forecast. Think of the atmosphere as a fluid. Think of it as an ocean of air. And you push a little bit here, it pushes here, which pushes there, which pushes there, which pushes there, and it expands. It's called the butterfly effect. One little change or one little modification here becomes an enormous one down the road. So, so the next time you wake up and we call for rain and there's like a foot of snow out there, you know, maybe just grumble and, you know, oh, those weather people, but we are trying. We don't go home after we get a forecast wrong and laugh and dance and say, I got you. <laughs> you know, the schools are closed again. They didn't have to be, but we got you, didn't we? You, you trusted me. No, we feel horrible. We tried our best, something changed. The temperature rose two degrees we didn't expect, and that made the whole difference between rain and snow. Today, the freezing rain, a half a degree. That's all it's gonna take. One half degree to make this pink area you see from Finley northward to change to rain. Thank you, Griff. Uh, it's a very thin band of freezing rain, but if you're driving right now up I-75, you're gonna have a tough go from North Baltimore to Bowling Green. Now, if the temperature, if the, ele the, the uh, highway is elevated at some point, that could be a five degree change. In this atmosphere right now, as you know, the bridges and overpasses can freeze first. There's two reasons for that. One, the air gets below it. There's no insulation from the earth. And two, it can be a different temperature off the ground compared to near the snow-packed ground. So, so just so much, it's a challenge, but it's fun. And I really do enjoy it, so very good. Uh, let's see, I do love my job. I love going to schools, as Ron mentioned. Usually it's about a school a week, sometimes two or three. We do charity basketball games. And just to see the kids' faces when you go up there, one, you know, they treat you like a star. And you're like, <laughs> just, just Jay, <laughs> you know, oh, can I get a picture with you or can I get your autograph? Okay, it's, just, it's still, it, it knocks me off my, you know, off the podium to think that people want my signature and I don't have to pay them for that. It's like, <laughs> okay, here you go. Uh, but just the questions we get from the kids, they're so honest, they're so open to anything. They don't have the skewed ideas already in their brains with weather, with life, with learning. So when you go in these classrooms and there's these faces just stare at you for a half hour like, ah, it's great. Just like you're doing now, right? You're, ah. <laughs> yes, the older kids. But uh, so giving back that way to the community is something that we do. Uh, it's not, not totally necessary, but I feel it's part of my job. If I can make one of those kids I visit a scientist and in 40 years they come up with an equation to figure out exactly when hail will form or a tornado forms. Think about that. Just one kid from the thousands of kids I've spoken to. That's all it's gonna take. Or to keep one kid in school. I go to a lot of schools. I go to uh, affluent schools. I go to inner city schools. And the differences are amazing. Just, I mean, it's not even fair, but, but just to give those younger kids and the kids that don't have as much as most of us do, you know, that half hour to hour of enjoyment and fun and some good education and you know, I get hugs after it. all the kids come up and hug me and it's like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. In a half hour's time, I made that impact on these kids. So, so think of me as an educator as well. I tell the kids, I go, I've got three parts to my job. One is the scientist that's making the forecast. Two is the artist, I've got to make the graphics you see. And three is the performer. Right? I'm performing on TV, I'm performing on stage, delivering the weather forecast. But a fourth would be also educator with the kids, so it's fun. 
Uh, one way I relate the weather forecast to, to you, and especially this time of the year, would be the NCAA brackets. I'm going back to gambling. <laughs> this is just gentlemen's bets, no money involved. But who knows, you know, the NCAA basketball tournament, you get brackets. Nobody does it, right? Not on work time or anything. Uh, but we have 60, depends on when you do it, what, 64 teams? 65, 66. Uh, imagine doing one of those brackets with 64 teams in a basketball tournament and picking the winner and the exact score of every single game. Now do that every day at work. Now do that and go on TV after you do that and tell people exactly what your scores are, who wins and who's the champion, and then wait around and see if it happens. <laughs> That's my job. There are actually more variables. I think the odds of the NCAA tournament to get an exact bracket is like one in 250 million. Well, the variables we look at, the, the clouds, the winds, the dew points, the temperatures, the pressures, the uh, cloud heights, the ups and downs in the atmosphere, there's more to that than even doing that NCAA bracket. So, so that's why it's so challenging. Uh, the What Did Jay Say campaign was not my idea. <laughs> it's, it's flattering, it's great, it's fun. When my kids got on TV a few times. Um, but it was a way to get my name out there for a different audience after doing the morning show for 13 years to kind of introduce me to those evening viewers. Because I still get people that think I've left town. We watched it for 13 years in the morning, you're great. Uh, you're back here on vacation or something? <laughs> no, I'm doing the evenings. Oh, we don't watch in the evenings, okay. But then the other side, you get people that didn't know who I was because they didn't wake up at 4.30 in the morning. And they say, oh, this new weather guy, Jay, he does a pretty good job. I've been here 15 years, but thank you. <laughs> so to kind of get my name out there, and it rhymes, and it's cute, and it's got a song and everything, uh, the What Did Jay Say campaign was started by our marketing department, promotions department, and it caught on. So, so don't think that was my idea, please. <laughs> You've got a big head. What did Jay say? No. <laughs> what did I say? Uh, but it's a lot of fun. All right, now to the weather. Okay, you've all been looking out the window many times this year and it's snowing, it's ice, it's cold. We have wind chills of 40 below. What is going on? And the answer is, in a simple term, the weather is stuck. The weather pattern that normally changes day to day, week to week, it's stuck in this pattern. Uh, normally we have a, what's called a jet stream. Uh, if you look at a map of the USA, there's kind of an oscillation with the cold and warm, like a seesaw, back and forth and back and forth. So we'll go through spells where it's really cold, then it warms up, then it's really cold and warms up. That would be a normal winter. With this winter, imagine a seesaw or a teeter-totter that's just stuck with one person, right? Weighing the one end down, and there's no one to play with. <laughs> there's no recess partner to jump on the other side to make, oops, to make things go back and forth. So that's the simple answer. Uh, we had an early snowpack develop. Uh, if you remember fall this year, like Thanksgiving time, it kind of got cold quickly this year. And that had a direct impact on what's going on today. Because of that snowpack in Minnesota, Canada, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, that's a reinforcing or a positive feedback on the cold air. So if we have the colder air in Canada, and let's say it advances to Minnesota, drops some snow, retreats a little bit, okay, there's still some snow. Now, the next time the cold air tries to advance, it has all that snow to go over, so it doesn't warm up, and it goes down to Chicago, and then retreats. Now there's snow in Chicago. Well, the next time the cold air tries to move in, it gets down to, like, Indianapolis, and the next time to Knoxville, and the next time to Atlanta, right? Twice this year, Atlanta's been hit with some pretty big storms. So uh, once you lay down that snowpack in the Plain States and the Northern Great Lakes, any moderately cold air that tries to move in, there's nothing to stop it. So it advances farther and stays cold. And that just has been reinforcing. You've heard of the polar vortex? That's been around forever. You just haven't heard about it yet, thanks to the Weather Channel and CNN and, and even my station. Uh, the polar vortex is, is a large area of weather that's usually near the poles. And around it, we have these little uh, like spokes. If you imagine a bicycle tire or a wheel going around, 
or, tire, or car tire, uh, and the, the spokes go round and round. Each of those spokes would be kind of a lobe of cold air that comes down and moves through. The problem with this vortex was that it didn't move. Again, the weather pattern stuck. So rather than coming through and being here for a day or two, that core of cold Arctic air sat over the eastern half of the US. It laid down more snow, stayed cold, nothing to warm things up, middle of the winter, short days, long nights. So it just reinforced itself. The storm track's been overhead. That's all related to this thing called the jet stream. But uh, each of these storms, which usually, or at least in the past two or three years, they've all gone through Chicago, which puts us on the warm side of the storm. This year, the storm track is more like uh, Cincinnati, Columbus, Pittsburgh. And that's a perfect place for us to get snow. So there you go. We are stuck in a weather pattern. Got a little change today. Uh, the storm today is actually going through Chicago. Unfortunately, the cold air is back tonight. <laughs> it's going to get really windy, cold this weekend, and we need one half inch of snow to break the all-time record. Have you heard about this? <laughs> it's been on the news, it seems like, every day. But we have 70, 70 what? We need 73.1, so we have 72.7-ish, because .4 would tie the record, .5 would break the record. So we'll see. What would be an even bigger story than our current snowy cold winter would be if we didn't get a half inch of snow from now until the end of the snow season. Could you imagine? Now through like April, less than a half inch of total snow. I think people would go for that, right? <laughs> we're done, but since we're so close to the record, might as well get a half inch of snow and just and beat 77, 78. That's our benchmark for winters. Any questions? We have, okay, we're on time here. Yes? So the Farmer's Almanac, I'm a city girl, okay? Farmer's and, Almanac, yes. And the Farmer's Almanac predicted this. How do they know? Did they predict this? They did. They said, because yeah. I, I live in, I live on the outskirts of town, and my kids are in a, in a country school, and so I've gotten to know all this stuff, right? And um, yeah, they said this is going to be one of the worst winters we have. I have no idea how. how what is that? And how does that it's a secret formula, <laughs> <laughs> and it really is. If you read the uh, the first few pages of that book, it says, you know, it's based in Boston, Massachusetts, I think. And it says, we use a secret, old, ancient formula to forecast the weather a year out. So the Farmer's Almanac, the question is, how did the Farmer's Almanac know it would be a bad winter? My honest answer, luck. Because they said last winter would be bad as well. You just don't remember that. Um, big thing, they almost got this one. I'm so glad they didn't, to be honest again. Uh, but they were predicting a blizzard for the Super Bowl this year. It snowed the next day, and it snowed heavily. But the game was fine, you know, the weather was in the 40s. But they have what they're looking at, and there is something to this. I'm not a big believer in long-term forecasts, but they look at the global weather patterns. They look at the output of the sun with sunspot cycles. There's an 11-year sunspot cycle, which is pretty regular. And the more sunspots, the more active the sun is, and the warmer it can be. I may have that backwards. I take that back. Let's just say the sunspot cycle, because I can't remember if sunspots cool the surface of the sun, which releases less energy, or it's the opposite. It doesn't matter to you. But basically, <laughs> there, there are cycles with the sun and cycles with our orbit and uh, ocean current patterns that, that happen over a long period of time. You may have heard of El Nino and La Nina. That's the cooling and the warming of the Pacific Ocean. We don't know why it happens. There could be aliens down there, for all we know. I'm kidding. <laughs> but they look at all those global things and just try to come up with a long-term solution. But it's, it's a good book. It's fun to read. I just, the forecasts are, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Jay, can you explain oh. what AccuWeather is? Is that a service? Is that a trade name? Uh, do you buy services from them? Or how, how does that whole thing work? OK, the question is, what is AccuWeather, which is a humongous weather, private weather company based in Pennsylvania? It's, uh, it's just off the campus of Penn State University, State College, Pennsylvania. And it is a, it's a private firm. 
They sell their forecasts to newspapers, and they also sell their brand to TV stations. I know there's a big station in Philadelphia that says, here's your AccuWeather forecast. So they may get some data from AccuWeather. They may get some weather graphics from AccuWeather. They may even get the forecast. But the name AccuWeather is trademarked, and it does have some definite um, pull in the weather business. So if you could imagine in Penn State, at Penn State, because uh, it's, it's one of the best schools in the nation, Penn State University for meteorology, um, they have hundreds of meteorologists that are doing forecasts every day. And they all have different segments of the US. Some are for newspapers in the New, New England area. Some do TV stations. They even record weathercasts in Pennsylvania for TV stations in Nebraska or TV stations in Montana. So it's just a huge conglomerate of meteorologists that sell their forecasts, their graphics, their information to other entities. Thank yeah, you. yeah. OK, yes. What is your relationship amongst your colleagues at the other networks? Uh, good question. He's asking my relationship with the other uh, weathercasters and meteorologists within the TV markets. Uh, it is a competition. It's a friendly competition, but that's how we make money. The more people that watch my station at 5, 5.30, 5 6, 11 in the morning shows and noon shows, uh, the more we can charge per commercial and the more money we make to pay me and, buy, you know, pay the heating bill and pay the Doppler bill and everything else. So it's a friendly competition. I don't see them as much as you'd think. Um, I've seen actually Robert Shields maybe five times in my life in person, even though he went to U of M. <laughs> he went to U of M, I think, four or five years ahead of me. So we never, never crossed paths there. But, um, so we don't really communicate. Uh, there is a, there's a chat room out there through the National Weather Service where we all go on and share. When it's a severe, life-threatening situation, we do put information out that we wouldn't normally. Like today, I'd say, well, our Doppler is showing the freezing rains in BG. I would not share that with them because that gives us the advantage. So think of it as a friendly competition on TV. We're trying to get more viewers. So are they. That's why you hear all these claims, you know, most accurate, best, only live radar. Uh, we were on first. We stayed on for two hours. We do that as a way to get more viewers. Yeah. We don't rumble in the parking lot. If, you got, <laughs> if you've seen the movie Anchorman, <laughs> maybe it'll come to that someday. But I don't know. In, in that movie, the news teams all had this rumble where they bring out the, the brass knuckles and chains and these baseball bats. And it wasn't pretty. <laughs> wasn't, that doesn't happen yet, at least not here. Yeah. It seems like we've been having more storms, and the storms have been more intense in the last year or two or so. Is that a result of, are we, going, are we in the midst of more global weather changes? Uh, again, I think it goes back to luck or timing. The question is, uh, the weather seems more active lately. Uh, we've had more extremes, pretty much is the question. Is that uh, back to the global weather pattern, weather change, climate change? You know, I, I think it's, it's more of a relativity thing, that as humans, the here and now is always much more vibrant, more exciting than the past. Um, there have been bigger storms. There have been windier days. There have been bigger ice storms. There have been sunnier days. There have been hotter days. Um, so I think it's more of that with a 24-hour news cycle and me going on TV for four hours and saying, it's still snowing. Hey, it's still snowing. Hey, we're, let's go to our live cameras. It's still snowing there. I think we give the impression that this is like a big, big deal. And it is. But it has happened before. It's just that in 1970, you'd see the weather guy come on TV or weather girl and say, you know, chance of snow tonight, maybe 6 to 12 inches. Good night. That's all you'd hear. Now we're on Facebook and Twitter and breaking into programming and doing crawls. And, and it's just it's so in your face that I think it gives the perspective or the, the illusion that it's more active now. We've had hurricanes. Okay, the problem with that, in the way of tropical weather, people now are building houses on beaches in Florida. Million dollar mansions on a beach in a hurricane prone area. When it gets hit, makes the news. Well, back in 1900, they didn't build on the beach because hurricanes came and destroyed things, so. <laughs> so it's, it's human nature in many ways. 
I believe there are cycles to our weather, so I think we are in a, maybe a little bit of an active cycle for us. But if you call California right now, they've had a very dry, calm winter. So just to, again, that weather pattern stuck. We're on the active side of stuck right now, but that should be changing. Well, <laughs> bad news. Uh, after today, it looks colder than average for the next two weeks, even though I don't believe in really long-term forecasts. Maybe two weeks to a month, we're back in it. I'm sorry. <laughs> But that could change. <laughs> Watch tonight, that could change. That's why, that's why we go on TV. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, okay. Anybody else? We've got time. If not, I'm gonna spiel about more weather stuff, so keep them coming. Having the snow all this winter, will that affect the summer as far as a drought of any source, or is it no difference? You know, I'm not really an expert. Um, there's probably somebody in this room more educated than me on the, the aspects of the farming and the soil mo moisture and the soil temperature. But I do believe it's a, it's a pretty good thing because it kind of traps the moisture we had. And once this all melts off, it will eventually go in the soil. Uh, the lake levels are way up. We've had no evaporation from the lake this winter because it's been ice covered and snow covered. And actually the snow has been adding up and adding to the lake levels. So from all that information, maybe a delayed spring uh, down here, you're far enough from the lake where you're not going to get that really cool breeze, but Toledo and even near Fremont, Port Clinton, Sandusky, because the lake has been frozen so long, it's going to be a very cold lake through maybe early summer, which could impact our climate here. But from all I've heard, it's good to cover the ground up for farmers and keep the soil and everything just in place. And hopefully our thaw happens slowly. That's the only problem now with the, the small threat of flooding, but that's what you get, right? Late winter, early spring. Anybody else? It's your chance. I was working with Blizzard Bill. How's working with Blizzard Bill? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> To be honest, Bill's great. He is exactly how he is on TV. He is passionate about the weather. Yeah. He, I don't see him very often. Um, only time I see Bill is either on TV or if we're doing team coverage. By the time he leaves, there's a little gap between our schedules. He's gone before I show up. So with that said, uh, we communicate via email and, and we do leave notes. One more question with between weather casters at the same station, at least for us, we don't just completely take my forecast with me and then here's Bill's forecast and he has something completely different. It does happen occasionally. <laughs> but the idea is to have a seamless transition from shift to shift and have the forecast be fairly consistent. Yes, there are changes we make with new information. Um, so, so I communicate with Bill that way. Um, he's been doing this for a long time. I used to watch Bill. We have a cottage in northern Michigan. When I was in northern Michigan on vacation, I'd watch Bill as a kid. That's how weird it is to work with Bill. <laughs> so I used, to, I used to watch you as, you know, going to the lake and going swimming and yeah, there's Bill, Blizzard Bill. <laughs> Same guy back then too. So he's passionate. There you go. <laughs> I'll tell you what, for him to be the morning meteorologist is a very positive thing. With his experience and following, he does radio stations all over the area. Even in, he does stations out west. He does stations up north still. Um, he's a great asset. With all that giggling and smiling and stuff, he is a good guy. It's good to have. You have so many on your station, other stations, so many different The news reporters, he's saying you always seem to have a lot of different news reporters. Um, news reporters tend to move on more quickly than anchors to a bigger market, uh, bigger and better things. Um, the Toledo market, out of about 220 uh, TV market sizes, and when I talk about a TV market size, New York is number one, LA is two, Chicago is three, I think Philadelphia is four. So the really big cities have a lot more viewers. And because of that, they pay their employees a lot more. They're making millions and millions and millions of dollars 
we're just making millions of dollars. So, so these reporters, usually younger and out of college, they probably came from a smaller station. They want to climb that career ladder by going to bigger and bigger markets, like I did. I was in Lansing for only a year, Terre Haute for only two years, and I've been here for now 15 because I've been moving up within this market as opposed to moving to a different station, so that's why. Do they only work like a few hours a day? No. Right, no, they work an eight-hour shift, just like uh, I do as well. Um, people think I show up at 4.59, go on TV, smile, point, go home, come back at 11, go point, go home. No, it's an eight-hour to nine-hour shift. In fact, some of the reporters have the longer days at the TV station. If there is breaking news at 10.45 p.m., and there's a huge fire in Fremont or Tiffin or somewhere, that reporter with a photographer in a live truck have to go to Tiffin or Fremont, wherever, and they might be there till six in the morning, working all night, gathering information, getting video, getting interviews. So their schedules can be skewed depending upon how active the news is. But for instance, the morning reporters might show up to work at three in the morning. They'll do live hits during the morning show, go do a news story between the morning show and noon show, go live at noon, write a summary when they get back to the station, and then head home for the day. But there's all kinds of different times. I mean, there's always somebody at the TV station um, with our weird schedules and, and news times, which may be changing in the future with cell phones, internet, on-demand technology. You may not have to wait till the 6 p.m. news to get your weather forecast, and you don't right now. But TV stations may start gearing more of their content toward the internet, toward the, we were talking here before the talk, that the, the younger generation wants information now. They don't want to wait till six. They don't want to be on my schedule. It's, it's your schedule. So when, when you're in, in your career, it's going to be on demand now. You're, just, you're basically on call, doing videos for people all day, all night, as opposed to a certain newscast at a certain time. That's been happening quickly, and I think it'll keep accelerating that trend. And someday, that will be the main way to get your news. There won't be a 5, 5.30, and 6 o'clock news. It'll be, when do you want it? Just hit this button. There it is. <laughs> it's, it's ready for you. Live, probably live as well. Yeah. Jay, your recommendation for uh, students in the room who want to break into the business, any advice that you could give to them? Advice would be, it's a good job. Plan on working really hard. One of the jobs that Ron mentioned was that at uh, CWS, Commercial Weather Services, was in Flint, Michigan, which is about an hour from Ann Arbor. I did the overnight weekend shift in this cold little shack, basically a shack, uh, drinking Diet Coke and eating potato chips, and was delivering broadcasts to WJR in Detroit and radio stations and county crews and ski resorts. But it was a big sacrifice for a year, year and a half. My weekends, you know, everyone else is going out to party and having a good time. I drove up to Flint, Michigan, stayed the night, and was in a cold little room working to get my foot in the door. Once you do that, once you do internships, you'll be good to go. So just keep doing what you can. Volunteer at newspapers, volunteer for any announcements. You guys have your local cable station. Perhaps get on that, do some reporting file some reports, some news stories. Um, so go above and beyond what your classwork requires because there's a lot of people trying out for the same job you're trying for. And if you have that one extra thing they don't have, oh, yeah, you've been on the cable network there. This person hasn't. We're going with you. But, uh, and it starts off small. It's very rare to start in a big city and make a lot of money in the broadcasting field. For me, it was, I was pretty lucky. I, Lansing to Terre Haute to here is a pretty quick journey. Um, but, but like most careers, you start small, you do a good job, people notice, they move you up, you move up, you move up. And the sky's the limit. I mean, we've had people from our station go right to New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. Uh, Rob Powers used to do our sports. He is the main sports guy at WABC in New York. That's the tip top sports job in the nation. Biggest station, most viewers, biggest city. 
Yeah, there's ESPN, that's cool, that's cable. But ABC in New York, for a local sports guy, he went from Toledo, Ohio, to that. So don't think you can't do that. <laughs> You can jump from you can jump from your education to a big market. You never know. But be prepared for change. Because in the time I've been doing this, 15, 17 years, 18 years, things have changed so quickly. I mean, when I started, it was it was literally do the news, sit around for four hours, go back on TV. Now I'm constantly replying to Facebook posts and Twitter and phone calls and emails and live cut-ins and tape cut-ins and our digital cable channel and our, um, you know, we do so much between newscasts that you don't see that by the time you have, you're in the job field and then you get into it, there's going to be a lot of work, busy work. But it's fun if you love it and do what you love. For me, there was a time, you know, it's like, okay, all this calculus and physics, this isn't fun, you know, but I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I said, okay, if I can get through all this math, I can get to where I want to be and do what I want to do. So at some point in your career, you think, OK, this is not for me. I don't want to be the low man on the totem pole and have to work weekends and have to work that morning shift, wake up at 2 in the morning for a couple of years. Then pull the trigger. Say, OK, what else can I do with my degree? I could be a media relations person, or I could be uh, working for the walleye or, or Tiffin University. You know, Use your broadcasting, your, uh, your education in a little bit of a different way. So be flexible. But do what you love. I don't know how many people in this room were lucky enough to have a job they loved. You woke, woke up every day, you know, you get out of bed. Do you want to go to work today? Yeah, there are days I don't want to go to work. <laughs> Tired, grumpy, had a bad night's sleep, got a lot on your plate today. But day to day, I enjoy talking about the weather. I would talk about the weather anyway. <laughs> They pay me for it. That's a good deal. So whatever you do, whatever your degree is, your paths can go in so many ways. I didn't plan on being a meteorologist on TV. I was going to be a research scientist somewhere and you know, be in the library looking up the 78 storm and the anomalies and the uh, heights and the jet stream and everything. And because of my internship, getting in front of that key wall and saying, I could do this every day. This is fun. That guided me in that path. So for you, maybe it's a, a field trip. Maybe it's a vacation you take somewhere. Maybe it's something your parents' friends tell you about, an internship in Florida at Disney World. Who knows? But if that takes you in a certain path and you like that path, don't be afraid to hop on. You've got your whole life ahead of you. You don't want to be stuck in a job you hate because every day will not be fun. <laughs> Put it, put it in English there, not be fun. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you so much for coming. Ride safely. Can I do one more thing? Um, Jason here has been taking pictures now and again. And because it was so early and, and kind of a drive from Toledo, we were not able to get a photographer out here to shoot this, to get video. So can I take your picture? And we're going to put this on the news tonight. <laughs> Does anybody not want to be on TV? I mean, yeah, he's doing, the, he's doing the, the bunny ears. So just a couple shots. I know it's going to be like a wide angle, but just to, maybe you can say, OK, I was wearing a, a white shirt or a black blouse or something. You can, that was me in the back right there. So I'm gonna, with my cell phone, I'm just going to shoot a few of these pictures. So this will take a few seconds. You can actually talk if you want. We have five minutes, so. Any other, okay. Any other questions? OK, any other questions while I'm taking your picture? This is your chance to ask uh, me almost anything. No? Yes? Well, I'd like to compliment you because I have a fear of storms and tornadoes. And my husband always makes sure you're the person on the television station because some weather people get real excited. Like they've been waiting for this tornado. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you keep me even. Well, thank you. And that's, that's in the back of my mind is that if I'm on TV going, oh my gosh, <laughs> what are you going to think? You're saying, 
That's not good when the meteorologist is like, he's upset. He's really, really yeah. going to go off like, he's like, you're on your own. You know, he's like, I'm out of here. So, so we do think, OK, we're here there to calm and to give information. Who needs to take cover? Who's in the clear? Where is it going? So thank you. What thank you. you have to take cover? We actually have a basement at the station. I was talking about that before. It's nice. Got a pool table and a kitchen and everything. Um, I would go down there with a wireless microphone and broadcast from the basement. I think that would just terrify That would be bad. It's never happened. <laughs> so you, yeah, we'd, we'd put up the radar, and all the uh, audio people, behind the scenes people, we'd all go to the basement. So you'd just see the radar picture and hear my voice okay. saying, we're in the basement right now. If you live in West Toledo, right. near the TV station, it's coming, yeah. You don't leave us. Unless, well, we have backup generators. Unless a disaster happened and we were injured or the building was damaged and I couldn't keep talking. Yeah, I mean, horrible. Um, but it has happened. There are some stations, I think it was Oklahoma City recently or one of those big cities that got hit, I think a year or two ago. The other TV stations actually began to broadcast on their channel to help them out. So that's one of those instances where, yes, we're competing with each other, but when a disaster happens, we're human. So. So hopefully that'll never happen, right? Okay, smile pretty. <laughs> okay, I'll just get this in for the room. Smile, smile. smile. Jay's taking the photo of you guys. Smile. Uh, he didn't call it a basement. He called it a bunker when he was sitting at the <laughs> table. <laughs> but uh, we really appreciate Jay coming out here today, uh, providing some interesting insights on the weather. Uh, showing us how some of this stuff works and making sure that the students got something out of this. I think his story is interesting when you think about how he broke into it. As you enter your career of choice, make sure you follow your dream, you follow the path, and, and you couldn't have said it better. I love getting up every day and doing the job that I do. That makes all the difference in the world and working with individuals that you can rely on and count on in your field, in your chosen field. So, Jay, I do appreciate well, your you, time. Man. And it's thank been you, a pleasure getting to know you over, the, you. over the last, I, I think it was four or six weeks or months, uh, when we finally got a chance to meet him. And he, he told me something. He said, I really appreciate you guys being so far out in front of this. Normally, I get a call 24 hours in advance. So really appreciate everything. You're Just a reminder before we let you all go, our next Good Morning World is March 27th, and this is, uh, this is one you can't you. miss. Uh, Mark Godsey, Good director of Thanks, the sir. Innocence Project, will be here with a gentleman named Dean Gillespie. Uh, Dean Gillespie was imprisoned for over 20 years. And Mark Godsey, uh, with his uh, Mark's assistance was able to get Dean exonerated after 20 years of, of serving uh, a wrongful conviction sentence. So it's going to be a great, uh, great Good Morning World uh, end to this academic year. So we hope we all, we see you all uh, March 27th. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks. Enjoy the weather. Have yeah. a great day. Good job. Thank you, sir.